Now, after that wonderful panel we've just had, we come to what's perhaps the real core of the Global Supply Chain Summit. The innocuous title Alignment really covers quite a profound business idea. And we've got another terrific panel that will follow a similar approach. The chairman is Dr. Rodrigo Cambiaghi, Chief Operating Officer of the US firm Axia Value Chain. Over to you, Rod Rodrigo. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, John. It's an honor to be here, to be part of the selected group. And I'm pretty sure that the, the audience will, will enjoy this, this panel because we have such a great uh, set of panelists here with different skills. We have academia, we have high executives, we have thought leaders. So I think it will be very interesting. Before I start, I just want to make a quick comment. I, I, as you might notice, I got a code last week that took me out of business for a couple of days. So I apologize in case of any, <clears throat> any problem in the communication. OK, let me quickly introduce everyone here. Uh, a little bit about myself. I started my career 15 years ago in the research side uh, on the supply chain management, moved to the industry. Uh, I started in Brazil, moved to the industry, to the automotive industry in Germany, worked for companies like Volkswagen, Daimler, and decided to move again, went back to Brazil, started my career in consulting. And uh, after a couple of years, we, I mean, some, some friends, we started a company, a boutique company in supply chain management. And since then, we have been developing the the, the company and in between we, we had a, I coordinated some projects in Europe and I took a decision to stop for a couple of years the consulting business I went for a PhD in Canada working with softwood lumber manufacturers and uh, since 2008 I have been working in Atlanta developing the business in the United States Canada and Mexico and yeah hopefully next year we are here in China as well and in Asia so John, we have here on my, on my side, we have John. John has, uh, everybody knows here, is a thought leader in, in, the, in the supply chain management, in the Dynamica uh, alignment model. We have also Tom McGuire. Tom is a general manager and, and corporate affairs and innovation for TEAS Australia. Uh, <clears throat> Tom will be sharing with us a very interesting uh, perspective, how they are applying the model in their operations. We have also Klaus Jort. Klaus is a research fellow at the University of Boras in, in Sweden. And he'll, he'll have the chance to, to share with us very interesting analysis and research that he has been doing in the e-commerce, how companies are using the dynamic alignment or are not using or should be using. We have Stuart Whiten. Stuart is the global head of uh, uh, multinational customers at DHL has a great experience uh, using the model and getting great benefits in Taiwan and some experience in Japan so he'll be sharing also with us um, the next panelist is Bishi Sen Bishi is the vice president uh, for supply chain at Unilever Indonesia and also will share with us very interesting um, uh, results that you're getting in Indonesia with the model and we have Deborah Ellis, that is the director of Ely, Carpenter Ellis, and she has been working with John very often in multiple engagements uh, in, in different countries. Um, before we start, before we move to the, to, the, to the panelists, I would like to ask John to give a quick overview about what is the alignment model for the ones that are not familiar with, where we are today, and what is your vision for the next five to ten years? for the companies and for the industries and so on. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. Let's see if I go. Yep. Thanks, Rodrigo. Yeah, my task is really to just give you the conceptual background of this and then everyone else is going to uh, discuss and, and explain how they've applied it because this is a developing thing. This goes back to uh, really uh, 30 years now. Um, I was in England during the, the late 70s, early 80s, uh, working with Martin Christopher, uh, in those days we were calling it marketing and, log and logistics. Uh, after five English winters I couldn't cope anymore so I came back to Australia and uh, got back to Sydney and started to think about what, because I originally was an engineer, I came out of engineering, went back to Australia and uh, you know when you've been away for five years everyone's forgotten you of course 
and uh, got into the academic world simply as a, a way of uh, getting a job in Sydney. Uh, but uh, my PhD was in this whole area of, of uh, channels of distribution and logistics and so I was very passionate about it and, and starting to look very seriously at it. And what I, what I started to realise was that there's absolutely no conceptual underpinning in the field of logistics. I mean, logistics, as we said yesterday, is logistics and supply chains about 45 years old um, and uh, it's, it's twice as, it's, it's younger than marketing. Marketing's 80 to 100 years old and they haven't got their act together in marketing. There's, marketing is a descriptive field and doesn't have many, you know, deep, uh, un, you know, under, underpinning uh, concepts. And the problem, if you don't have underpinning concepts and conceptual strength, you have no predictive ability in, in, in that. And, uh, and when we looked at logistics, you know, about the only useful thing was EOQ you know, economic order quantity, and that was about it. Uh, so um, I got together a group of people in the early 80s, and I was very fortunate. I found people from South Africa and other places in Debbie, and we decided to try to come up with a, a new framework. And um, it, it was a bit naive at the time. Uh, we weren't too sure where we were going. But what we, what we, uh, we really uh, decided on was this four-level uh, conceptual approach. We called it alignment. Uh, there'd been people around talking about alignment for years but never covering that, that, the four levels. And the four levels of that model essentially say um, if you want to make money in any business, and this is a business concept, we didn't go straight into logistics or straight into supply chain. We, we had to sort of, in a sense, redefine the business and then come backwards into what does that mean for supply chain, as it turned out. And what we essentially said was, look, if you want to make money in any business, there's four things you've got to line up. You've, you've got to understand your customers in a particular way. And if you understand your customers, then you have a, the second level is you respond to their requirements in a particular way. And, and that was well known in those days. That was called strategy or business planning, and everyone knew that. But then you might notice there's a line there, and that line is where you then disappear under the water to where all the forces of darkness exist in most organisations. And so the third level was cultural capability. And what that means is, is that if you really, if you understand your customers and you understand how you're going to respond to them, that's only half the job because then you've got to go underneath and you've got to look at your organisation and understand uh, how you're going to configure your organisation and your people to have uh, the cultures that will drive the strategies into the marketplace because what we found over the years as we went on in our empirical work that between 40 and 60 percent of the words that you write down on paper never get delivered and it's got nothing to do with you know um, any anyone competitors all this Tom Peters and you know Michael Porter mumbo jumbo quite frankly he's got nothing to do with anything it's about people not wanting to actually do the things that you as leaders want them to do. Because you're, you're up there saying, guys, this is what we're going to do. We heard the panel before saying things like that. But deep down, so they're all going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then deep down they're going, no, 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 not going to do that. And it's a pa passive resistance. And we found a huge misalignment between levels three and levels four. And the final level is, is leadership. And you know, the older I get and the grumpier I get, the more I come to realise that the only thing that matters in life in, in a business sense is leadership because it all starts from there. It's a circular thing um, and there's a huge correlation between those uh, organisations that have a leadership team that understand their market. There's a sort of a, a hard link between level four and level one and my view is that if you can get um, those two things right then the things in between, the strategies that we apply that you know, will be appropriate and the way we manipulate our organisation and, and configure it will be appropriate and they're really derived. But if you've got a leadership that's out of touch with its marketplace, it doesn't matter what you do in strategy terms or what you do in organisational terms, um, you, you know, you're going to go around in circles. So that was the concept. Now, as you know, everything goes horizontal in the supply chain world. Um, and so I just wanted to turn that around and make sure we've got your head sort of configured in the right way. It's the same model, you know, except now we're talking sort of uh, right to left. We're saying, you know, clearly understand the market. Uh, as Roddy said yesterday, the, the good organisations like the Dells, the Snyders, the, the Cisco's, the Unilevers, in, in the last few years have, have finally understood that 
you have to start from the outside and work in because for too many years we have been uh, configuring our supply chains from the inside and then looking up and hoping that they will connect with the outside world. So that's the, just the horizontal version of that. And that was the concept. And that was in sort of in the early 80s, around about 89, late 80s. And then you'd probably say, well, what's he been doing for the last 20 years? Well, um, what I've been doing is populating that, that concept, that conceptual model. And that's why all these people are around here. We've been working, you know, this is not the sort of stuff you can get sitting in a university. Uh, you've got to go out. You've got to uh, get companies who are prepared to experiment with you. And, and through this experimentation, we built up a, a, an understanding of what it really means. And what we found is that one size fits all doesn't work. What we found is it doesn't work because on the right hand side there, not all customers are the same. Because if you, if you think that one size fits all in the supply chain, sounds easy and sounds sort of convenient, but if you think that works, then what you're really saying is that all customers are the same. We know they're not. And what we found was, and it took like 20 years of work to finally, you know, get this, is that in any market for any category of product or service, there's never more than three to four dominant buying behaviours that represent about 80% of the market that will give you. And so three to four dominant buying behaviours gives us an 80% fit to the market. What that tells you is that we need three to four supply chains, configurations. So my last slide is this. I'm going to take you... Um, and, and just say, this is where we were on the top, where we were. We didn't know about the right and the left on the because the thing also works in reverse. We didn't know back 20 years ago that, you know, that customers uh, had differences and that we could easily categorise them this way. All we seem to be doing is in the middle trying to make everything fit a one-size-fits-all approach. That's where we were, and the bottom doc diagram is where we're going. And, and, and uh, you're, you're going to hear some examples of that, where, where by recognising that uh, there's three to four clear uh, segments, behavioural segments out there, what that effectively means is that we have to have three to four configurations. And that doesn't mean exceptions. That simply means, um, you know, different combinations of standard components and processes and, and, and um, um, activities and things of that nature combined in different ways means that running through our organisations, it's a bit like thinking of the metaphor of conveyor belts. We have three to four conveyor belts and any product, this product, can go down any one of those conveyor belts but be delivered uh, in a different way because customers want to buy the other way. And what that and superimposed into that diagram is you can see the verticals. And this, as I said yesterday, is the biggest problem we've got today, particularly those companies who are starting with an organisation structure that they've now got to transform. And I think Pat McLagan's got about 120 years of work here. Um, is that, you know, we, we've recognised is that, the, that, that every time you walk in in the morning and sit down, have a cup of coffee and turn on your, on your laptop, you are already 90 degrees out of phase with your customers. And you spend the rest of your time trying to work through the day and exceptions. So what, what, we've, what we've come to the conclusion is we're never going to get rid of the vertical functions. We need them. But what we also can tell you is that they're never going to deliver the satisfaction to our customers because our customers buy horizontally and we're managing the businesses vertically. vertically. So how do we get around this problem? Well, we get around it by developing clusters, those little clusters, diagrams that I sh um, sort of got on the, on the left-hand side there, where we start to genetically engineer our organisations by seconding people from the verticals into the horizontal clusters for short periods of time, a year or so, and then, you know, they go back and forth. And when they're in those clusters, they then are responsible for managing the, the supply chains. And when they go back into the verticals, they are responsible to the people who are developing the specialisms. And the same works as you look backwards to the supply base as, as it does looking to the customer base. And this is, this is giving you flexibility. Because all this stuff about AAA and all that stuff and how Lee goes on with, it just doesn't work. The, 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 the point is that... that Flexibility is not about having a single supply chain and then making it do everything. That's called duck shooting, you know. Um, 
the, the, what, it, what flexibility is, is creating a number of configurations and then as your customers move up and down, as they move away from being loyal to price sensitive to d demanding in terms of time and back to loyal, and as they move up and down on that right hand side, you just pull the different levers um, you know, that mean that the products can be uh, you know, moved down to them and that is what gives you flexibility without actually having to run around like a, a headless chook. So that's what multiple alignment is, and um, more and more organisations are picking it up. Uh, Annette, when she was at Dell, um, picked it up and, and did a lot of work there. She's now trying to figure out how to do the same at Snyder. Um, and we've got great examples around Tom um, at, and, at, at uh, Tees in Australia in the meat slaughtering business, and uh, uh, Bish at Unilever, and um, all these people you're going to hear now are going to give you examples of how they've taken these ideas and, and customise them to make it work for them. Very good, John. Before we, we move to the next panellist, uh, I would like to first ask one question. Please raise your hand if you are familiar with the model. Who is familiar with the model? Oh, very good. Hey, that's great. I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Do you want to say that again? <laughs> Can I take a photograph of that? Yeah. <laughs> Who is somehow trying to apply the model in different stages and so on? Okay, very good. Uh, uh, before I move to Tom, I would like to bring two cases and I'll try to do something here that I was never able to do. That is to explain two projects, two alignment that we had in five minutes. It's just to give an example of uh, different transformations that we spoke yesterday and, and different results. Here is the first one, is a case that we had in, in, uh, in the Brazilian market, is the larger distributor for MRO. Uh, in that particular uh, marketplace. And it's interesting because it is, it is a company very successful that it grew a lot organically along the years. And they, they got to a point that they were really in trouble in the finance. So, and you can see how because the, the way they grew, they grew, it was basically based on high inventory levels and next day deliver for every customer, every SKU. And just to give you a, you know, a ballpark number, they had about 70,000 SKUs, uh, customers, and 120,000 SKUs. So that created a massive uh, problem for them. And at the same time, the Brazilian market was growing, so they were uh, trying to figure out how to, to, to really get this done right for the growth. It was when we came in, I mean, John was there, we educated the leadership that they need to go for different value propositions to understand the marketplace and make sure that they have different supply chains. And as you can see in the chart, so they really, they clearly had different value propositions, uh, different buying behaviors in the marketplace. So based on that, based on identify, so we interviewed all of the customers, we validated with the sales team, so we did a, a hard, hard lifting in terms of understanding the marketplace. And once we did that, we were able to reverse engineer all the process, so all the SNOP process, all the available to promise, and everything else, uh, and all the organizational design. So a long story short is that uh, the company was able, after 18 months of implementation and one year uh, running the business in that particular, in this, in this new business model, so they, they, they were able to turn around financially because they had a, a growth in revenue, they had a, uh, a, very, a, a very strong reduction in working capital, and they are still running. So they are learning more and more about the clients and so on. That's a very successful case that we had. But not all the cases are all the time successful. This is another company that we, we had, and that's a meat processor that is a competitor <laughs> of Tom. <laughs> <It's not> Tom. <laughs> And that's an interesting case because it, it shows how sometimes fragile those transformations are. And, and we, we've, when we first got there, so it's a company, just to give you a number, it's a company of $33 billion revenue uh, with global presence and, and so on. It's the global market leader. And, and basically the, the issues that they were having in Brazil, again, the market growing and, and the, the, the lower classes in Brazil consuming more meat, they were facing a shortage in terms of cattle. And the, main, the old mantra that they had in the organization was, all the suppliers are the same, you know? If you offer 10 cents more, they sell to you. If, if you don't offer, they will sell to somebody else. And the leader, I mean, at that time, the president was saying, there might be some way that we can 
really think about this business. I'm not convinced that that's the way to go to just fight for price and so on. And, and after analyzing that, so we, we, we did a pilot in one of the most important regions for them. And we found out something very, very interesting for the company that only 19% of the, the suppliers, they were really interested in price. I mean, not that the others were not, but that was exactly the, the example I gave. 10 cents more, I go to somebody else. But there were other segments that they were willing to reward different services. And that was very interesting. So we spent uh, months talking to the leaders and convincing and so on reverse and engineering the process and how this, that would be. So we prepared the case, it was very successful. And one day we, we received a, a notice that was, I mean, very, very sad that the president passed away and nobody was expecting. I mean, it was a, a very hard situation in the company. They brought a, a, new, a new and old because they brought the family back in to the business and they brought also in the old style. So that is still sitting somewhere in the company, and they did in advance, although they had all the, all the, it was very clear for them that the benefits would be very, 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 very good. So I just used those two examples to, to turn over to Tom. I know, Tom, that it, that's exactly the, the business you're in, but also to share, you know, the results that you are getting, the hurdles that you might have during your, you know, your journey. Sure, uh, thanks Rodrigo, and it's always interesting to uh, be led in by a story about one of your competitors. But, uh, <laughs> Failed. <laughs> I, uh, I think that, uh, and first thanks to John for having us here, and th this concept's really important to us, and um, testament to that, there's actually two of my colleagues in the audience as well. Um, and what I want to share with you today is perhaps two experiences, because uh, I think they're both important. Um, the first is a bit about me, and um, it says in the, in the bio there that I'm in the process of completing an MBA. Now, that's finished, and I'm not saying that because there's great relief. Well, there is. <laughs> but um, what's really interesting there is I sat here yesterday, and I actually was fortunate enough to be here three, or in, in Sydney three years ago, and one of the central themes of this conference was how do we bust up silos in a business and channel an organisation's energies towards customers. And uh, that came out yesterday. I think almost every speaker had that as a central underlying theme. Um, but it's really interesting doing an MBA because uh, then the one I'm doing, one I did was a, a large Australian business school, and the last half was with a very well-known US business school. Uh, and they're very busy churning out the next silo captains that you're going to deal with. Um, you spend time learning about human resources, marketing, finance, et cetera, et cetera. And they're all unifying in the fact that they say, this is the solution to business. This discipline will unravel the mysteries of business to you. Um, and it's very, very difficult sitting there after you go to, between one, the next one, and the next one. It makes sense of the world. Then you come back to business, and the stuff's really hard to use. Uh, and I guess the real strength of the concepts that uh, John's developed is there's actually a tool there that's really unifying when you think about it. And start with that, because if we can't unify ideas, and it's a bit of a challenge for the academic world, it's really hard to get alignment in business if we can't get alignment across all the, the disparate disciplines in business. So turning to our story, Tease Australia is a meat processor. So in, in beef processing, as I was reminded this morning by uh, our CEO, used to long for the days when we could just uh, kill cattle and cut them up. But <laughs> we heard yesterday that the new normal um, means that those days aren't ever coming back, not, not soon. So, And Tease is a new organisation, Tease Australia. It's been around for nine months. So what I want to share with you is a story about a merger that created Tease Australia. Uh, a merger between businesses run by the Tease family and the Cargill in Australia. Um, and it was during that process that we, we found we had a real business model and business problem and John's, uh, you know, John's model we, we saw and still see as a real way of executing a successful and value creating merger. Um, so at the, this is not a supply chain problem in my, I don't come from a supply chain world, I'll admit I've sat at these conferences now twice, and maybe it's my fault. I still don't know what 3PL is. I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But that's a really important thing to talk about at the end when we talk about implementing this stuff because language is really important and we've got to make sure as leaders in our area we're not creating a language that no one gets um, unless it's just me. So about eight, the, the business formed in September last year and uh, some 18 months, two years prior we started talking and the first thing you do when you're a bit curious about business models is you uh, try and download some information about mergers and acquisitions and the first thing you learn and people here know is they don't work out real well. Um, I think it's Harvard Business Review tells you about 80% of them fail. So when you digest that bit of um, news and work out that you've got to try and do something a little bit different, uh, the next logical conclusion is you start to work out, uh, well, how do you make it work? And you start reading these, ac well, these this, this academic theory and you build a longer and longer list of what goes wrong and still can't make sense about it. And, and I guess what it comes down to is at the strategy end, they say you do, you've got to do, pick one best way of doing things. You're either a cost leader, you're either a product leader, or you're excellent in customer intimacy and customer solutions. And a lot of the issues with mergers is when you put two businesses together, they try to be all things to all people, uh, and you end up in what we term the zone of mediocrity, and I'm going to steal Rodrigo's term, he called it a duck, because the issue with a duck is that you know, it, it can swim, it can walk, and um, it can fly, but it really does none of them real well. <laughs> and as a business, you don't want to be, and, and, you know, and that's the key driver for mergers failing. So we thought, okay, we know one best way. That's easy. You know, we'll, be a, we'll continue to be a cost leader. Um, and, but the problem was this little financial crisis occurred, and um, being a cost leader wasn't so much fun anymore in the Australian industry. Markets went haywire. We all know what, what happened post 2008 and 9. And the business model looked broken. Um, yet, and we also knew being 20% of the market share in Australia and in a disassembly business, so if you think about a disassembly business, uh, you've actually got to use everything that you produce. You can't pick and choose. Um, we had to be in all markets. So we had to go back to the same MBA discipline and say, we have to be all things to all people. It doesn't work. We, we can't just pick one best way. So how do you go about doing it? And that's the key problem for us at the time was we have dedicated assets and we have dedicated people. We can't afford as a business to set up individuals in each different business or supply chain to perform function and serve a customer. Simply can't afford to do that unless you've got a recruitment strategy where you, you seek people with multiple personality disorders which you know, probably has other issues, you've got to find another way. And really that was the sweet spot for us with John. I mean, I was first introduced to John's concepts about, you know, as I said, four or five years prior. He must have got a lot smarter since. Um, but when he came back into our business, um, it really made sense to us. And the, the uh, last diagram that was up there really crystallises it for me and for us. You, if you take the supply chain concept, and it's not something that the bloke that organises logistics does or that happens at the back door of factories, but it's something central and core to business that runs through it, you really can start organising people in your business around key clusters to service the different value propositions that are out there. Um, and you can make a real difference. And I guess where we're at today is, I mean, we're still on the journey. We're nine months in, so there's no, by no means finished. Uh, and we've got lots more work to do. Uh, but we have been successful. I mean, I'm pretty proud to say that the team, uh, we haven't destroyed value in the business. Um, and I think we've got the talent and the team together now that's engaged in the business. Um, so we're a long way ahead of the 80% that you know, I read about two years ago. So it's a really good start. Now, what are the keys to that? Um, and John said it uh, five minutes ago, leadership. Uh, and not just because the CEO's in the audience, so I, I should say leadership's important. Um, leadership is, you know, leadership, leaders that are able to debunk that mental model that the MBA school set up, you know, that, you, you know, that it's one of these discrete disciplines that's going to unlock the key to success. But leadership to understand the things that John's talking about and then to give them a go. And, I mean, at the end of the day, and I guess the closing point is that it really, um, the inconvenient truth about it all is it's about people and culture. 
who I'm in is very much about getting people in the business, doing new things, looking at customers and, and uh, trying to unlock value with customers and changing what they do today. Um, you can wrap it up in any model you like, etc. but it's about the people. Um, so all the change management things that are hard and take a lot of dedication are the key, are really the recipe for success. And as I said, we've unlocked that. I guess the next steps for us now is, uh, uh, that wasn't us up on the board before uh, about <laughs> supply chains, but uh, there's a chapter in one of John's books about that, and, but we're about to embark on uh, the same segmentation activity with our supply chain, and I don't know, John, maybe we'll make the next chapter. Yep, next book, for sure. Oh, well, very, very good. Yeah, Thank very you very good. much, Tom. Uh, it's a very interesting story. Uh, uh, it's the first time that I see a company going through this path. At the same time, it's going through a merging process like you are, so it's, it's a unique case. John, any comments? Yeah, I think what it just reinforces is that, uh, going back to the original model, we, if we started from the bottom up and tried to sort of reconfigure or reconceptualise logistics and supply chain, we never would be sitting sitting here today. Yep. What we were a bit lucky, and, uh, and you know, I, I make this, uh, you know, we, we were lucky to have some good people and we were very lucky, uh, I won't put it in the same um, category as the discovery of x-rays or anything like that by accident, but we did discover that if you go and reconfigure and reconceptualise how the firm works and then come back through and realise that actually the firm is no more than a, than a, than a, a, a conglomeration of supply chains running through it. And you know, so going from the macro firm down back into uh, understanding that it's made, the firm is made up of supply chains, uh, the, in other words, the business equals supply chains in total was a very big leap for us and I think once you make that leap then you can invite CEOs into the audience because now y y y they will listen to you because it's important whereas if you if you just keep talking supply chain mumbo jumbo uh, they just hand it off to their EVPs and so on and I think that's a point we're going to hear I think one of the things Bish did very well at uh, Unilever he disguised what we were doing there or what he was doing as a business alignment uh, project and I don't think ever mentioned the word supply chain till, right, till it was too late. <laughs> Very yeah. good. Let's move now to, <clears throat> to Klaus. Klaus, please share with us a little bit about of your experience working with the, the e-commerce and, and, and in Sweden. Yeah. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, John, for inviting me here. And Pleasure. First, I would like to comment on Sweden is a quite small country in the world. Um, I'll ask, I live in Borås and I work at the university there. And we are actually three representatives from the small town of Borås here, here in the summit. So you'll meet uh, Niklas Sedin in the, in the ninth panel tomorrow. And you met my professor, Dag Eriksson, yesterday when he was in, in the panel. So I will discuss uh, how I applied the alignment in my research. And I, it's, it's quite a different story because my research area is returns management. And returns management is one of the defined keys, key business uh, processes within supply chain. And I look at the consumer return business within the e-commerce, in, uh, in the B2C e-commerce. And uh, from the return to management perspective, the, uh, the alignment comes in, into the act, uh, avoidance activity. There is a return avoidance activity within the return to management and trying to avoid returns. I'll try to show you how, to, how the e-commerce business actually can avoid certain returns by aligning towards their customers. So, uh, Early in my research, I started to research with a company in Borås called Elos. Uh, if, if you look at the distance sale of the e-commerce and the mail order dis, uh, business in Sweden and, and, and in the nor northern Europe, it's quite polarized. The old mail order business that started to sell via e-commerce as well, they don't know what the customer requires. And they, deliver, they promise a delivery date about one to two weeks when you order from them. If you look at the other side, the e-commerce, the, the clear new e-commerce business in, in, in Europe, they deliver the same day. So the one business are luck, 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 uh, quite likely overproducing and underproducing towards customers. They try to deliver within one to two weeks, or at least they deliver when they can. They don't ask the customers. They have to accept it. On the e-commerce side, they deliver the same day if you place the order before one o'clock. And I believe that the right thing is somewhere in between, asking the customer, when would you like to have your delivery? Is it today, next day, next week, or whatever? So 
I started to look into the, re, into the return information that the customers or the e-commerce business stores. And they store a vast amount of data that's supporting the business with little information, though. They have hundreds of thousands of consumers buying from them, but they don't analyze the data. If you ask the, the, the companies about consumer returns, they say, oh, it's product related. It's size and fit mainly. And of course, it's size and fit issues mainly, but it's also related to the demands on the delivery time, et cetera. And that, I will try to show you that. I started looking into the data from the company. We, we used all data regarding sales and returns for one year time, all customers uh, in, in Sweden. And I can actually see that the return level, how much the customers were returning when they purchased, was related to customer age, first of all. We can see that younger customers return more than old ones. We can also see that the return level was related to delivery, delivery time. So we, if we follow the delivery time, extending the seven to nine days that they actually promised the customers, there was a huge increase in, in return rates, especially from the younger ones placing order on the, you know, via, via the uh, e-commerce. We can also see that the return level varies with channel. They had three different channels. They had the, uh, the phone order customers, the mail order customers, and the e-commerce customers in, in the same company. The mail order customers, they return more, a higher level than the phone order, and the e-commerce customers return an even higher level than the mail order customers. So we, we follow up on that study, and we can see that the e-commerce e customers that were, were generally younger ones, they delivered faster delivery from, from the e-commerce business, and they also had uh, much more, many more uh, uh, competitors to choose from. So the competition plays a role there as well. And after that first research with, with LOS, I started to look after an upcoming company, a quite new company uh, to follow, that didn't strategically think about returns management. That, uh, so I found a company called Nelly.com that started in 2004. Uh, and they, they really use the one-size-fits-all. They deliver the same service to all customers, and they deliver all orders the same day they place the order. So uh, I'm quite su sure that they actually over-service yeah. quite a lot of their customers. Yeah. And the interesting thing is there that they get their orders on Friday, Friday nights, and Saturdays, and then try to push it out on Monday. And they, they can actually work on the warehouse uh, doing nothing the rest of the week. So I talked to the manager there, and they said, OK, re returns and returns management is quite important for us, but it's, it's not a strategic issue. We don't care about it. We just let customers return what they want. And in Europe, we have the consumer directive that are transpo transposed into national law. And it actually lets the customer return whatever they purchase on, over the distance, like phone order, mail order, e-commerce, without giving any cause. And in Germany and in Finland, in, in Europe, the customers are also entitled to return free of cost. And we see this kind of legislation actually uh, uh, change the customer's purchasing and returning behavior quite a lot. So what we did was to look into Nelly.com's data and we took all customer orders and all return orders for two years time for four markets for Norwegian customers, the Dan Danish customers, and Swedish and Finnish customers and started to analyze the data. Uh, from the beginning the, the, the company they didn't care about analyzing return data because they were just focused on selling, 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 taking new orders on getting more products and going out to new markets. So we started to analyze the suppliers and we started to analyze their customers, how profitable they were and, and so and we can see, look at, looking at the business, they normally just look at the aggregate level and see 25% coming back in return, that's the business average, we are quite okay, don't do anything about it, just let it be. But we can see that looking at the product level, return levels varies from 2% up to 80. But still, they, they treat it in one, one fashion. They treat the suppliers in one, one fashion, and they purchase products in, in, in one fashion. We can also see that the, a certain amount of the customers were quite, they were actually unprofitable. They were using the system. They were borrowing products, using them, and then returning them. So we used all sales and return data for two years' time, and I was, I've been struggling to get the, the, the managers to, to think about returns as a strategic part of the business. 
it's quite strange for me to, to look at companies getting one-fifth of every shipment coming back on average without looking at it strategically. Uh, and the competition in Europe now is so fierce in, in the e-commerce business. So they are starting to compete by letting the customers purchase and they get the free delivery and free returns. That's a condition that they are trying to compete with today. So we can see that the average return level at Nelly.com has increased from 25% to 40% in one year. And they have also entered the German market and the return level there with free return and free freights is 75 to 80 percent. <laughs> and still, they are over-servicing the customers, delivering them to the same day they place the orders. So there's what, where the align, align, alignment principles come in uh, in my research and in, in my business. Yeah. Very good, Klaus. Thank you very much. It's an interesting environment. Uh, okay. it's, uh, you see in one side, uh, if I... Uh, the, there is the competition increasing. You have new markets, so they are getting into new markets. Uh, they are developing their own brands. Yeah. So that's another complexity that they are bringing in, that are legislations and so on. But on the other side, they don't have the culture. I mean, it's, uh, that's right. it's, uh, they don't have the old culture to eliminate. So it's much easier to, to convince them. So what is, how do you think they pick up the concept and how quickly they move? It took them quite a while actually to, to pick it up, but now the increase in return rates and the problem from when they actually started to sell in Germany and they're trying to get global now, they, they understand that they need to do something. Yeah. They can't push in the, in the same direction that they have been doing for since, since the start, but it, it's an interesting company. In 2007, the, the turnover reached 2 million US dollar, and t this year they will reach 140 million US dollars. So they have a have tr tremendous growth rate since they started. Mm -hmm. So now they're actually asking me to help them to, to, to align and to implement return to management and implement uh, dynamic alignment, mm -hmm. trying to see what that, could, what that can do for their business mm -hmm. as they glo go global. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because with, a, with an e-commerce company, you would think uh, given you know, the, 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 that it's a very young company, yeah. presumably the people in it are fairly young, that they would have had less resistance to uh, picking up the ideas that you brought to them. You, you can understand the old bricks and mortar companies having this problem. Uh, I'm just surprised it's taken you know, a couple of years for you to convince them. Yeah, uh, I'm that, surprised too, but that's, yeah. that's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. And later I'm going to ask Stuart to, to give an, an overview because you supply as well, I mean you service also some e-commerce platform, so what is your perspective on that? But before that, Stuart, if you could uh, introduce uh, what you, you, you have been doing in in, in Taiwan, in Japan. Okay, uh, Rodrigo, thank you very much, and John, thank pleasure. you for the, uh, the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here, and um, I sort of thought, how do, how do you explain 13 years of knowing John Gutorna <laughs> and 11 years of trying to implement and work with dynamic alignment, and, and really, the message I want to get across is that it's an evolving process. It's a continual mm -hmm. process of learning, and as you're learning, you also get a greater appreciation for the complexities of business as well. Uh, so it's a good platform, a good model from which to really understand not what you do, but also what your customers do in the environments that you operate in, which I think is very critical. So to me, it is, it is a fact, it works. And I think what John's been able to do, and I think to Tom's point, in some of his old log logisticians, the ones that put their hands up in the air yesterday and have driven forklift trucks and uh, moved trailers around in the yard, um, is that this really created a model for us which allowed us to put in which, what instinctively we knew, particularly when you deal with the customers. But we responded in event management. So every time we got confronted with that event or with that customer, we'd trigger a new response based on experience. We didn't have a systematized approach to managing that buying behavior. And this model really allows us to put that discipline through uh, the organization. And in that journey, and again, um, it's interesting you're saying this, you know, after two years, people still don't seem to get it. And Tom, you mentioned that, you know, when you first got it, you didn't, well, saw it, you didn't really get it, but then the penny dropped. Um, and I was a bit like Tom when I first met John, I was like, my Lord, what's he talking about? <laughs> um, but once I sort of actually read the book and spent more time with John, the penny did drop. 
And the important thing here is the scalability of dynamic alignment as well. Because if you remember that first slide that John put up, or the second one, whether you want to look at it vertically or horizontally, that's literally the only piece of paper you need in your pocket when you're running around doing or running your business, and whichever part of the business it is that you're, that you're managing. And I had the, the, the good fortune of John mentoring me and uh, working with me in Japan, in Taiwan, and um, we, he's a good mentor from what I'm doing from a global capacity now. And when I was in Japan, which is probably one of the hardest business environments I've ever operated in, uh, from, from the business culture uh, perspective and engaging change in that marketplace is, again, probably one of the hardest cultures uh, to, to, to manipulate and change to the desires that you're looking for, is we chose to look at it at a single function and the function within that organization and the enterprise that it was. And at that time, we put a huge amount of investment into Japan, um, but we weren't getting any returns. And we had to change the entire sales culture and the way that the organization looked at customers, managed customers, and even learned how to say no to customers as well. Um, the results of that, and Scott Price will be on a panel tomorrow, he's now the CEO of Walmart, and Scott was my boss in Japan at the time. Um, but we turned an organization from losing 70 million a year to about 30 months uh, making a profit of over 120 million. And that was customer led. Everything we did was centered around the customers. John then decided it was time for education to catch up with experience, as he, as he called it. So he wanted to get me out of my sheds, off my forklifts, uh, away from my customers, and introduce me to Martin Christopher at Cranfield University, uh, where I then did my uh, Master's of Science. And Scott uh, decided that now it was time for me to go and run my first true operation. So I was given Taiwan uh, again. Uh, an economy or a, a business model that was transitioning with the manufacturing from uh, where it was in Taiwan, it was off, uh, on, uh, offshoring particularly into China, and the whole business dynamics was changing. As a result, shipping volumes in and out of Taiwan were dropping uh, rapidly, uh, double digit declines in terms of the volumes that were there. But of course, my parents in Germany, Deutsche Post, expected us to grow each year. So how are we going to do this? So it really was about share of wallet, really understanding the marketplace, changing the dynamics of what we did there. And again, through understanding that customer base and re-engineering it back uh, through the organization, not just within Taiwan, but where Taiwan influenced, so particularly greater China, uh, the business model to get the results you're looking for. And again, we grew revenue, uh, but most importantly, uh, the, the EBIT uh, grew significantly by about 20% in, in 18 months. And just on Japan and Taiwan, what's interesting today in my role, I go back to these countries quite frequently, is the model that we put in place is still in play today. It's been adapted a little bit, it's been adjusted, but that language that you were talking to, and I'll be happy to buy you a coffee and explain what a 3PL is. Um, <laughs> but um, when, when, when you talk about the model there, then people still understand the language, it's in the culture, and it's become part of the DNA uh, of the organization. So that's really quite refreshing to see. Now globally, and by now, by the time I moved into a global role, I've been running around with this dynamic alignment model in my pocket um, for about eight or nine years at this stage. And, and DHL Express was going through a huge transition at this time, where we'd become the victim of acquisitions. Uh, and our parent company, Deutsche Post, had been running around the world buying every Tom, Dick, and Harry and giving it over to Express to manage. And one of those disastrous acquisitions was a company called Airborne, uh, which the old red and white culture of Express was against from day one. But when I left Taiwan and was promoted into this global role, the first place I went to was the United States. And I had to explain to 46% of my customer base that we were moving out of the domestic market in the United States. Really good first day on the job. Um, so my customers, I didn't know whether I was going to be greeted by shotguns, baseball bats. Um, they're pretty unfriendly. They weren't very happy with us. Um, but we had to manage through that process. And, and again, we've had fantastic leadership with a gentleman called uh, Ken Allen, who's my boss. He's the CEO of Express. And just to give you some numbers, by almost unconsciously following a dynamic alignment model because I've been doing it so long and running that global sales channel, uh, which 
probably is about 30, 35% of the total uh, revenue within the group. We have had a, a, a significant impact on the results. In 2008, we lost about 3 billion euros as, as, a, as a company. Last year, we produced just under 1 billion. And this year, we'll probably get about 1.4, 1.5. And that is because we've driven an insanely customer-centric organization and taken that back through. So learning and evolution. I've talked about the function to how we then went to an enterprise at the country level to then how, how you can take it global. So I really want to make sure that people understand the scalability and the flexibility of it. Critical success factors of what I would say to making this model work. Really, 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 really know your customers and understand what customers to select and what to focus on when you're dealing with those customers. And it's okay to say no. And in fact, many customers respect you if you say no, but they respect you even more if you can present them with alternatives as well. Um, what's also important is focus on your core products and services and populate specialist activities with people that really know what they're doing and don't be frightened to pay them either. But most importantly, make sure that everybody in your enterprise understands their role and their role relative to the value chain that you're contributing to or the value proposition that you've got. And as I go around my customers or I go around parts of some of my sister companies, it's amazing how many employees really don't understand the role they're playing in their organization or the contribution to the customer that's in there. Ensure absolute focus on quality, quality, quality. John Mullen, who is uh, uh, now uh, back in Australia, but I uh, sort of followed him around. He was at TNT with me, and then he popped up at Deutsche Post DHL. Um, but he always said quality, quality, quality. And again, followed that very quickly with communicate, communicate, communicate. And again, one of the things we, we really do is make sure the leadership does a minimum of 20 customer visits every month. We do town halls wherever we are, regardless of function. So even if it isn't your function, making sure people understand what's happening globally. Uh, we basically took out all of the regional offices and area offices, so we're straight down to the coal face now in terms of the people we talk to there. Um, but we take ownership. We inject that passion into the business. We communicate with the forklift drivers, the guys that do the pickups and the deliveries, the guys that are on the shop floor processing uh, shipments, or the ladies or the gentlemen in customer service. And the message is consistent. So communicate, communicate, communicate. It's important to always challenge your operating platforms, but in, in, you know, those around you within the enterprise, allow them to be involved in that challenging process or challenging that enterprise. And again, make sure you're engaging the marketplace on a daily basis. Um, and remember, it starts with one person understanding it, and maybe only understanding 80% of it, because it is a learning journey. But if it get, gets quite infectious, and that passion is contagious. And once people start to see the results, it's quite amazing how quickly you can build the momentum. So have faith in yourself. Go out, try it, engage in it. Call John. He's a great mentor, uh, and he's got a very big whip as well. It works from Australia, and sometimes he knows when you might have taken your foot off the accelerator and you get a phone call out of the blue. So be ready for that. And um, again, take that one slide, put it down into a business club size or piece of paper or get it laminated, put it in your note file, carry it with you. If you understand that model um, and you work with it, then I can pretty well say that's the only thing you need to run your business in your back pocket. Thank you. Very good, Stuart. Excellent explanation. <coughs> uh, John, any comments? You no, I mean, involved with Stuart. What can I say? I mean, uh, it, it, it was one of the early successes we had, and it, it wasn't, it didn't take a huge amount of uh, change. It, it, uh, I think you had about a thousand customers, didn't you, in Taiwan? And the problem they had was, in those days, DHL definitely had one product, which is we're the fastest from point A to point B, and you pay a premium for it. Um, and what Stuart did is he went and did the survey, um, found out that there's about 200, 300 customers who didn't want that fast premium product. They wanted a two to three day product, uh, a little less price, reliable, in other words, you know, they weren't using DHL. They wanted to use DHL, but it was there was a misalignment in terms of the service, the product. And so by recognising that, he was able to rejig his sales force and the processes at back and everything else, and just by, you know, re, you know, realigning, if you like, 
uh, your, your, your processes and your organisation and the allocation of your, your, your sales force and everyone else. Um, that, that's, and it took a little bit of effort inside because people faced with change don't like it, but he, Stuart has a really interesting leadership style that's sort of, um, yep. he's tried to adapt it to Asia, but it doesn't go, you know, it's taken a bit, it's always in my way or the highway, but in an Asian <laughs> way. Um, and, and, uh, and, and the results were there, and I, I, I think the numbers were, when you went to Taiwan, I think you must have done something wrong because they put you in Taiwan thinking that would sink you. And uh, it, I think Taiwan, in terms of uh, EBIT, was number 47 in the, in the world of uh, DHL. They went to number one in 18 months as a result of that realignment. Um, so uh, what can you say? It works. Excellent. Let's move to our next panelist. Uh, Misha, can you please share with us a little bit of your experience at Unilever? So just to give you a bit of a background about the business that I come from, uh, Unilever Indonesia is about a 2 billion euro business and uh, we operate in about 14 categories starting from laundry powder and margarine to top end uh, face care products and uh, personal care products in hair and oral care. Uh, and manage a business, uh, we manage a portfolio of close to about 1500 SKUs. Now, uh, the old mantra that kind of guided this whole uh, supply chain was about um, can we have it a little cheaper? Can we have it a little faster? And by the way, when you figure that out, can you be a little more flexible? Um, so that was the way that the whole, whole thing was being run. And at some stage, we started looking at the metrics and we said that, look, there's huge volatility we see in terms of demand. Um, however, when we look at the consumer offtake metrics, it doesn't seem to be reflected in the consumer offtake metrics. So you see sudden spikes in, in, in demand, but it doesn't get reflected in market shares going up. You see sudden spikes in terms of uh, primary sales, uh, but you don't see that in terms of either penetration or, or, uh, or, or consumptions going up. And we start asking this question that, how much of this is being caused by us trying to apply a one-size-fits-all business model to the way we go to market? Uh, and it's not just about the supply chain, it's also about the way we sell in, in the market. And that's where um, we, I met John and uh, Debbie and we started working together in terms of segmenting the, the, the process, uh, the, the whole portfolio that we have into um, a set of, we started off with a cut of four from the 16 possible uh, segments that John has in his uh, framework. We picked up four and then finally we narrowed down to two. We said we would actually, to start with, apply a two-segment cut, so one which focused on lean, uh, 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 lean uh, supply chains and one which focused on agile supply chains. And the thing was that, and I think uh, Tom and Stuart mentioned that for customers who were looking for lean, we were over-servicing them, and for customers or, or, uh, who were, or, and, or, and consumers who were looking for agile, we were trying to take cost out of the chain, and it was this uh, classic uh, mess that we have. So at some point then when we, start, we, start, we applied this and <clears throat> the other learning that we had is that every time you go to the board, uh, so I sit in on a board and if I tell my colleagues on the board saying look we're trying to do something in supply chain uh, and guess what we're going to segment the supply chain, uh, people look interested for the first uh, 30 seconds and then you can see it in the thing saying yeah why don't you go and do it and just tell us about it later. So we said, look, this is not about a supply chain. This is about how you drive the business. And one of the problems that we have, and I think Tom, you mentioned this, um, that supply chain folks usually talk a language which is very different from what businessmen understand. Uh, so we go in and talk about service levels and case fill and uh, on-shelf availability. And you can see the chairman saying, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, <laughs> but so we said for this project, the way we would drive it is we would we'd talk about the first driver we talked about was how do you create growth, how do you unlock margins, and how do you liberate cash. And we said we'd, we'd measure the success uh, of, this, uh, of this entire initiative on just these three pillars. There might be uh, secondary metrics and secondary KPIs which underpin this, but what we would take to the business would be uh, essentially an impact on growth, margin, and cash. The second thing we said is that, look, this can't be driven by just supply chain folks, because then it obviously becomes a supply chain project. Um, and we said, so what we did was we put together a bunch of 
uh, young people with, uh, who we rated as being the next set of leaders for the organization. Um, and people from all kinds of backgrounds, from marketing, from sales, from finance, uh, and from supply chain. And we gave this team the, the job of landing this whole process uh, in, into the business. Now, the results we got at the end of uh, the first six months, so we, we, we started three pilots, uh, limited scale. The results we got were fairly spectacular. And since then, we've been kind of exp uh, rolling this out. We've been, going, uh, we've been on a journey of both um, expanding it across more uh, categories and more SKUs, and equally expanding it across more geographies and more customers. Now, to give you a sense, we are looking at, on a 2 billion euro business, we believe that this, uh, in the last one year that we've done, we've got about 30 bips of extra growth. We're talking about 40 bips of extra margin, and we're talking about close to about 15 million euros of extra cash. So that's what we have seen. Um, now, for the specific, some of the uh, some of the specific initiatives that we took on was for face care. Now, face care is an interesting category in these kind of markets. Um, if you promote face care products, and you said we're talking about products like Pons, which you sell at 25, 30 dollars uh, a pack. The moment you start promoting it, you start getting consumers. You, tr you attract new consumers. So consumers who would not have otherwise bought into your category start buying into the category. Now. Therefore, in the, this is a category where if you make an intervention, you start seeing extra growth. In, these category, in a category like face care, which is obviously, of course, an enormously profitable category for Unilever, we've seen a doubling of growth in places where we've applied a direct-to-store delivery model. And by the way, we work with um, Stewart's company quite closely on that. Um, and we're seeing a doubling of growth. Now, just imagine the sheer mix impact on the bottom line as a result of seeing a very profitable part of the portfolio doubling in, uh, in terms of growth rates on account of a different way of going to the market. So for us, it's been a, um, I mean, it's been a fantastic journey in terms of um, landing this whole thing. I think the challenge going forward is living it every day. And it's not about just uh, a, a set of projects and pilots. It's about living it every day. And it's about living it in every part of the business, and therefore, um, sustaining it uh, as we go forward. That's been our experience. Very good. Thank you very much, Ish. I will turn out to, <coughs> to Debbie and ask Debbie, your experience uh, over 20 years of experience in supply chain consulting involved in most of the, in most of the, the projects. So how do you see, what is your perspective? Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Um, Yes, I started these projects when I was 11, so that's <laughs> the first point to make. <laughs> um, the, the job that I have when uh, I work with John is to take the concept to the next stage and to try and understand what that means in this company, in this situation, and to try and get the pragmatic, I have to say, supply chain pieces out of the equation or the, the, the pragmatic uh, operational implications out of the, out of the concept. Um, but I think what I learnt you know, many years ago in Master Foods when I didn't have a concept uh, is how much easier it is to look at a factory to look at a transport contract, um, uh, to look at a team of people and know what to do about them when you have a concept. And I think this takes us back to that first day when we said, let's talk about design. And the reason we put that panel on was that the chairman, two years ago at his own conference, said to his audience, what is the design of your supply chain? And I thought, yeah, that's a really good way to put it. What is the design of your supply chain? And usually the design of our supply chain is some evolutionary thing that has developed over time and it's, you know, sort of, it's a bit fatter here because we had a uh, very long 
term 3PL contract where we really did like them and you know we let them get away with a lot over time because there was a great relationship there. Um, it's, it's a bit short on uh, you know, s service in this sector because we really didn't think mining was going to take off in Australia. You know, it was puttering along at about the same level for about 20 years and so we've under-resourced and under-serviced that. So I, I take Pat's point very much. I wished when I worked for Mars and worked for SWI that I'd had a mental model to organise the activities that I was responsible for. And that's why I think now when I have to follow John in and try and say, well, you know, how are we going to make this happen, um, uh, that it is so much easier than it was back then. Uh, so let me just take you through. <laughs> this was, you know, my version of, uh, uh, this was uh, Roger Martin. Do John used this slide on the first day and I wanted to link back to it because uh, and, but Pat said it better, me mental model. We, we go out there and we solve problems. We find mysteries and we come up with great solutions, great products, great services. You know, we came up, that's a heuristic. This is how we're going to interpret that. You know, Steve Jobs had one way of interpret to interpreting it. Nokia had another way. Um, they were interpreting pieces of that mystery in a new way and producing their heuristic. McDonald's took, you know, the combination of cars and food and a, a changing environment and said, um, we know if we can, you know, get people food in their hands in three minutes, then we think that might work. And, well, in fact, the McDonald's didn't. The guy, that, you know, before McDonald's did that. But McDonald's came along and said, they found all of the algorithms that made that happen. And that's the next stage of the equation. I position alignment as a heuristic. It's a way of seeing the world, it's a way of organising the world, and it's a way of taking all of that mystery and complexity and turning it into something. But the next stage is the algorithm. That's why Lean has been so successful, because it has been a heuristic and it has been an algorithm. It has, it has allowed people to turn what they want to do into an algorithm. But what we're saying is that one heuristic in the supply chain is not enough. Usually it's more complex than that. There's more things going on with that. But 4,294 heuristics aren't going to work either. That's just too hard. You need some reasonable rational number that you can work with and that you can make sense of. I'm going to show you an example, um, or a case study. It's uh, a little bit aged now. I, I say that it's about five years old, but the distribution centres and pick centres that needed to support it have just been built. So you know, perhaps they're not. It's not that old after all. Um, and this is taking, you know, that concept of alignment and. It's going really down to grassroots. It's going down to the infrastructures and facilities that, that many of us you know, get involved in managing every day. And it's saying, when you've got that hard asset, you know, what, is there anything different about it if you've got a heuristic that says, you know, I've got three supply chains? Um, this project um, was a network modelling project. And I want to talk about network modelling because we're talking sophisticated to concepts here. We're talking very complex situations. Uh, we need sophisticated tools. And I think that we can have a great concept and we really know what we need to do to get to it, but we've got too much complexity in front of us to actually make order of that. And that's um, you know, why I think John and I have both been big fans of using the best available decision support and applying it to these problems because they're just too hard to do with yeah. great experience and great spreadsheets, just beyond that. So using those good tools and putting it with a good concept, this, this was a project um, that was firstly a footprint project. They said, we want to reduce our footprint. This was an Australian company that had uh, manufacturing in each state, which means about six manufacturing operations. They had uh, 
are probably 14 distribution centres sitting under that. Um, and then it had what they called these trade centres. Now, if you and I walked into a trade centre, we'd call it a warehouse. Uh, and they were selling building products. They were big, cumbersome, uh, expensive to move, expensive to hold products. And when we looked at a footprint project, can we reduce the footprint? Now, a network modelling project will do that for you very well. It will probably give you 12 to 18 per cent reduction in cost. Incredibly, that it seems to always fall out, you know, within that range. And um, if that's all you ask it to do, that's all it will do. And you'll have less facilities when you wake up tomorrow. But what we ask it to do, what we did first before we did that, was to do a customer segmentation. Fortunately, in the business at the time, there'd been a, a, a lot of work done at the customer level and a lot of research done. And so a combination of using that research and putting all the marketing and sales people in the room at the same time meant that we were able to segment customers quite clearly for the first time. This had been a business that had been taking plasterboard that sits around the walls, you know, the, the largest part of a building structure and delivering it next day to everyone. Once we looked at those customer segments, it became very clear that there was a lot of very different things going on. There was a distributor coming in with his, you know, with his truck and he was taking sheets of plasterboard back to a two hour away location to put them in stock. And he was coming in four days time to put some more in stock. We then had a, uh, a, 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 a what we call a 10 pallet truck lining up to take a, a load from that same distribution centre to a house that was being built. And the customer for that was a builder. And he'd rung up yesterday, but then the truck that loaded returned two hours later because it was raining. So what happens? The truck has to go and do something else. It's only 10 a.m. in the morning. It's offloaded. It's put in the distribution centre along with the stock that's going to the distributor the next day. And the builder is a bit slack. So he forgets to order it again the next day when it's rain, not raining and he remembers an hour before he needs it. And so the next day there's a mad panic uh, to, to service him. Uh, in that same customer group is a commercial delivery that's going to a high rise. Floor 24 is going up today. The crane has a booking schedule. The crane has a 10 minute window. It doesn't matter whether it's next day delivery or not. They could have given them 42 days notice. But they didn't ask for that. They, they said, next day is good. So they got next day notice, one day's notice for a 10 minute delivery window. And as we go along, you, you can see the pattern. Very, very different requirements coming out of essentially the same facilities. The trade centers of another interesting uh, uh, situation and I think it typifies something that we've learned. We always talk about collaboration with big customers. The most interesting thing I've learned and it's been reinforced with the Unilever work is that there's an enormous collaborative opportunity with small customers. If you look at any supply chain and you look at the smallest player in the supply chain, how often you know, are they the loyalist? Very, very often if you look at the beverages supply chain and you look at what Americans call mum and pop stores, look at the alcohol supply chain and small liquor stores, you know, anywhere where you see, and every time we've seen a tradesman and you segment the customers, there is a very high percentage of those customers that fall into collaborative. Not all, never all, but maybe it's 40% whereas the industrial customer might be 20%. I think the Unilever, Bish talked about lean and, and I think in many ways what we'd call continuous replenishment, right. you know, the way that you've interpreted it. Their big opportunity is, you know, at the distributor level and in Asia, the distributor is that loyal 
customer, very often a very long-standing relationship. Um, and, and very often, if it's you know, the portfolio theory, put all of those small customers together and you get a very stable load, very stable supply chain. But the other thing about them is, sure, we're delivering product to them, but what those small customers need is support. So I think collaboration at the top level is about relationship, engagement, all of that when you're talking at business to business. When you're talking at the trade centre level, if you're talking at that small customer level, relationship is about support. And what this model and this equation showed us was that the trade centre <coughs> needed to be that contact, needed to be that support. It didn't matter what was sitting in that warehouse, it didn't need a footprint. It needed a coffee bar. It needed a sausage sizzle on Wednesdays because it was the networking centre. It was that hub. It was their social activity. It was their, where they found business. It was all those other things that pulled product through the rest of the supply chain. It was fine that it came out of the pick centre. It, it was fine that if it was bulk and was going to a plane, it came out of the distribution centre uh, because the trade centre's role in life was to supply relationships. And I think that's why, you know, supply chain, we get caught out because we forget about those really critical pieces that don't quite fit the equation that we've become used to managing. So using, using the, you know, the, the, the pictures that some of you may have become used to, the coding, you know, we had that relationship, you know, we call big I, small A at the trade center level. We were supplying at the pick center level <laughs> flexibility. And what does flexibility need? It needs space, it needs capacity. And that's the great contradiction between putting a distribution center that has distributors going through it, feeding stock equations down the line, and putting this highly volatile activity. They have different space requirements. They might both still be plasterboard, but that doesn't matter because the, the space per, per cubic meter of plasterboard for lean was, or uh, even if there was a relationship, continuous replenishment was quite different to the space requirement for flexibility. So that capacity is the core thing that we've learned about agile supply chains. They need capacity, they need capacity in people, but they need literal capacity in plant and distribution centre for the same, the, the same piece of sales that, that's going out. So, Am I, can I do one more slide or have I gone too far? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. we can have one more. Because, and then we're going to turn to the audience to take yeah. some questions, I think. We have okay. a large group here, so it's... Yeah. I, I'll, just quickly, I will show you this. Some of you have seen this. It's a, it's a slide we've used very often. Um, but to me, it, 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 is, it is a good way to, to tell you about the different supply chains. Asia and Australia are different in that I think America and Europe are much more focused on consumer supply chains in terms of consumer products and uh, high-tech products. We have to manage both because we, you know, we're often the starting end. We're taking it out of the ground. Uh, in China now, it's the factories. So you're very much on both ends. Um, but those, those layers are, I think, a very, a very good way to look at it. And I think it's good for those who manage supply chains to think of it like that because it's also the de demand planning model. You know, if you look at the behind all of the demand planning systems and look at how they operate and look at those algorithms that sit under them, this is the profile you see. And what I think we need to do is to understand how to find base load and the best base load comes out of continuous replenishment collaborative customers. It comes out of collaborative customers which create continuous replenishment. Um, the second best is, is you know, what we call lean because it's transactional. It hasn't got that relationship element to it. Um, the, the most difficult to manage often is agile um, and, but, and it's the most difficult to predict and it's that other piece in the you know, demand planning profile. But I think the, the forgotten piece I think we all need a supply chain for fully flexible. We talked about innovation yesterday. We talked about how we do it. We talked about, you know, what do we do when we've got a disaster? But I think that what we do when we've got a disaster is the same question as what are we going to do five years out? It's the same skill set. 
It's about creativity and imagination and new models and stepping outside our own industry and looking and going and seeing what mining's doing in, in Australia and trying to translate it into Ralph Lauren, what Ralph Lauren are doing in, um, in, in fashion. And that's where the big answers are. They're usually not in our own space. They're crossing spaces. And I think you know, a, a fully flexible supply chain in all of our organisations is probably only a room with five people in it. But it could be the most potent piece of the whole supply chain that you know, we have available. Sorry, Rodrigo. Very good. Thank <laughs> you nice. very much, Deb. Uh, it was very interesting, your, your perspective. And, and I think you made a very good point. So once you get the concept right, and then you can apply the tools like the network design or the ATP or whatever it is to really respond to that model and, and to, to the marketplace properly. So we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, I would like to, uh, to open for questions. And I see Roddy Martin. Uh, Roddy Martin. I mean, the, there's no question that the, the outside-in segmentation ma minimizes complexity uh, to a huge extent. But yesterday, one of the profound insights with Pat on the panel was this whole uh, mental models and goal streams. In other words, how do you continually adapt people's goals to execute against these you know, outside-in strategies? What I'd really like to hear from the panel was how did you all execute? Because this is all about execution. We have great segmentation strategies, fantastic supply chain technologies, but if you can't execute aligned goals, nothing changes. Very good point, Roddy. Bisha, you want to take that? So, um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. That I, mean, I think the, the the charm and the excitement of the of the <coughs> segmentation concept lasts about a week, and after that, it kind of <laughs> we start worrying about how am I going to make this land? And it's then it's not just about landing it once, but landing it every day because that's the second part of it. That uh, so for us, I think the big one was. Um, a, first of all, getting the right level of resource commitments done and getting, and like I said, getting board commitment to the project. Uh, so at a project stage to bless it, saying, okay, we're with you on this and we, we believe that's the right way to go. Once you start getting the, uh, the right results, it's, in, it's then about uh, ensuring that this enters the vocabulary of the business because um, if, if, you're talk, if this becomes a sideshow, if this becomes another slipstream, uh, so we've got a way of doing business and guess what, on a uh, Friday afternoon we're going to talk about segmentation or alignment, uh, this is never going to work. So it has to become the core of the business itself. So that is the second big learning for me, that how do you wire it into the business language itself. Um, and therefore all reviews, scorecards, metrics need to change to reflect that. So we can't be having an operating with a set of metrics which, is, which kind of look at the uh, thing as one lumped mass and then be talking about segmentation and alignment on a thing. So these are three, four things. One is, one is about resource commitment. Second is about very quickly wiring it into scorecards, metrics, and review processes. Very good. Gerard de Villiers. A question to the panel. I can see a lot of merit uh, in the models, and I know the models, and I know they work. Uh, and the company examples are all large companies. Does that also apply for a very small company where you have difficulty to have critical mass in some of those particular supply chains? Uh, question is, can you apply this to a very small company where you might not have the same volume standard with a large company? John, I think you were there. Yeah, uh, look, uh, thanks for that question because uh, I get it asked it about every other day. Um, uh, you're right. Uh, the, the thing about the larger corporations, they have got enough headcount to put dedicated teams or clusters. And by the way, um, coming back to Roddy's question as well, it's uh, the interesting thing is the um, the way you genetically engineer the teams, which are a combination of the technical skills that you want and the mindset. So if you've got a bunch of collaborative customers there and you're putting a team together on the inside to service those customers that could be geographically dispersed but you, they, you regard them as all collaborative, then you, you, you've got to look for people you know, with procurement and, and operations and marketing, put them all in one room. But you've got to make sure that the bias that's built into that particular team is uh, relationship. Whereas if you're dealing with a group of customers who are demanding and agile, and you're building a team on the inside to handle that supply chain, then 
you, you want the bias has got to be speed and take risk <laughs> and make quick decisions. So in the bigger organisations, you, you have got the headcount. You don't need additional headcount. It's a redistribution of how you use that headcount. Uh, as you move into small companies, I think you need better quality people in a way because you're then asking um, people to, uh, to multitask. You, you, you haven't got enough headcount to build dedicated teams, so you, you, you want people to, uh, who, you know, who could be in two teams. You could have someone who's the um, marketing person on, on two teams. They could be in the collaborative team and they could be in the, in the agile team. And they've got to know, uh, you know, which team they're in at a particular point. And you can do that by um, flagging all the customers. You can, co you can code customers. Um, because actually the interesting thing is customers don't shift their positions very much unless they change their decision units inside their businesses. So you can either colour code customers or you can code them in a different way. And so as the orders come through, you train everyone inside the organisation to recognise that, oh, that's a red customer, that's an agile customer, therefore we'll treat them this way. So it's much easier then for people to be able to multitask and know what they're hand. You know, I keep saying if you know what the customers are, you can train monkeys on the inside of the business in a way, but if you start asking them to multitask, then that gets a bit more difficult. You need high quality people and monkeys. If I can just add to what John said, I think it's, uh, it is equally applicable to, to a smaller organization. My experience was that, look, uh, while we talk about Unilever, uh, so my specific business in Indonesia is about uh, two billion euro, two and a half billion dollar business, but it's a collection of many small businesses. And the principles are equally applicable. So the smallest category that I'm talking about is a 40 million euro business. Uh, and, and it's equally applicable and it's equally beneficial to that kind of a category. Yeah. Very good. Could I just add to that, Rodrigo? I think sure. the other thing that uh, when is part of uh, Christine's uh, guidance of us through the meat and livestock industry, we work with some small businesses. Yeah. And what, what uh, I think we saw there was that you, with limited resources, you actually have to decide where to compete. And in many ways, this gives us a vehicle to say, yeah, right. okay, uh, my natural instinct as a business, as a company, is this. So that's why I'm probably feeling a lot of strain trying to service agile customers or demanding customers, because my, my build, business has been built up over three generations of collaboration. And uh, so that, you know, there is a natural space often for a business. And, you know, we, we can call it niche, but we've often not known what niche meant. And, you know, probably niche means the ones that we feel most comfortable with. But sometimes that's part of the business isn't big enough. So what it says to a small business is you actually do need this second level of capability and then perhaps you, you, you're operating in two segments. But what tends to happen is you actually try and operate everything in the way of your natural tendency and not do a very good job on these one or two other segments that could be your growth opportunity. So you tend to stay small because you, know, you don't know how to grow through different uh, mindsets. Uh, yeah, thank you. We're going to take one last question. Uh, from Trevor Miles here from Canaxis. Deborah, I wanted to thank you for bringing it down to execution because in the risk uh, panel yesterday, there was a definition about risk in the future, about identification, mitigation. Risk is every day. It's not just big events. It's customers who change their mind. Uh, we work in principally with customers who have highly configurable end products that cost millions of dollars. Uh, Black Hawk helicopters that make, it's got 50,000 items in the bill of material. Very few of them come off the production line that are identical. That's a very different system to bars of soap. Those people, execution is where it's all about. It's the people who have changed the delivery date. It's changed the avionics. It's changed the uh, quantities. It's changed the location. Managing that dynamic supply chain in the now is a lot more important than trying to define what you think it's going to look like in six months' time. Because that's where the value really gets derived from. So, John, you know, I'm a strong supporter of segmentation. I, even within that environment, uh, they need to understand, are they selling to military, are they selling to commercial, are they selling to quasi-government like the Coast Guard? 
because all of those customers have different requirements and therefore you need to do the alignment. But where is this discussion from risk identification to risk mitigation to risk response of dealing with the now, the real demand that is 65% forecast error, sorry, 65% forecast accuracy is typical in the industry. If you're only forecasting 65% accurately, your ability to satisfy that demand is radically reduced. Sure. So how do you focus that short-term response to real demand and do that profitably rather than prepare for a world you're never going to encounter? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, just the, the, the situation you just said then, if the uh, um, uh, demand is that volatile, uh, it immediately means that you, you, you have to shift to a different uh, a supply chain configuration. If it's that volatile and, and uh, um, up and down, we need an agile supply chain, which means we need more capacity, uh, which means we either need that capacity in terms of inventory to offset the risks, or it could be equipment capacity, or it could be two shifts or three shifts. Uh, you know, the capacity comes in different ways. And we've, we've experienced this with the um, uh, coal exports in Australia, that um, uh, you know, the people who come and buy coal uh, and you know, from Australia, largely the Japanese power stations, who are so predictable, you could put your watch on them, and you know, the, in fact, they can even tell you which ships coming to Australia in 18 months' time. But no one, had, no, none of the mining companies had ever asked them that. They just said, put a ship in the queue if you if you want coal. So you know what mentality of human human behaviour is. By golly, I better put a ship in the queue. We had 75 ships in a queue a few years ago. 10% of the world's capacity of Cape sized ships sitting off Australia waiting for six weeks to be filled up with coal. And the railways were all you know, clogged up. And the only way we could get around this was to say, hang on, there's a bunch of people here who can give us that predictability. Let's treat them separately. Let's give them different berths. Let's see them coming with GPS. Let's shuttle trains up and down. Let's have different stockpiles. Get rid of that 60%. Now, this other 40 is creating all the chaos. Um, we'll treat them differently, we'll have a couple of de dedicated births, we'll do things quickly if they want, but by golly, they, if they don't tell us, and we have to act quickly, because we now ac actually have to have extra train capacity, some of which it's sitting there doing nothing, and then other times it's working, then you've got to pay a premium for that. And they either want it, and they pay a premium, or they fall into line and start becoming part of the... So you actually can start to sort of, in a reverse sort of way, can't you? You can start to train people to behave in ways that are, you know, perhaps a little bit more efficient mm -hmm. to them. Thank you very much, John. I know that we could have, a, you know, another discussion for, for hours, but unfortunately we have uh, to finish. The panelists, I would like to thank all the panelists for, for the great um, words here today. And they will be here, so we're going to be here today and tomorrow, so make sure that we, we have the, the conversation during the coffee or later today or tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.